morning. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. We are um, gathered here this morning to take some testimony and have some committee discussion on S-124, uh, Miscellaneous Law Enforcement Amendments. We have, uh, we have a couple of witnesses with us this morning and um, Representative Donahue, I just wanted to uh, confirm with you how long you are with us um, because if you have an urgent need to get out of uh, this committee room to go to another committee room, we would take you up first. I, I, I do not, I'm ready to go anytime, but I can also, uh, you know, well, I, I don't have a competing meeting. Okay, great. Um, so in that case, I would love to, uh, to ask uh, Dr. Nesreddin Longo to, uh, to join us first. And Eitan, thank you for being with us again on, um, on this issue. We, um, we have a, a lot of work ahead of us in terms of uh, evaluating the different parts of this bill. And I would love to hear your thoughts on, um, on how how you feel about the bill as it stands and any suggestions that you would make on strengthening it. Absolutely. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, I actually can be very, very brief, which is refreshing, I'm sure. Um, the, I, I, I actually am very fond of the bill. I thought, isn't it nice to be able to say that? I love being able to say that. I'm very fond of it. I, what I, tr one of the questions I had was over the issue of process equity, um, which of course is very critical and certainly very, very much uppermost in the minds of members of historically minoritized communities. Um, given process equity, and I, I know that there has been an attempt to get a lot of voices that are not usually heard at this hearing. And I know that that has not been as successful as I think anybody had hoped. Um, so I've been spending a lot of time thinking about that um, because I think it's important still to think of process equity, even if there are people who do not actually at the moment want to be part of the process. There are probably a lot of reasons why. And I would say in this case, a lot of it is sort of generational trauma um, that people really, and it's structural, right? This is not about anyone personally. People don't trust legislatures. They don't trust law enforcement. Um, I've had people say that, you know, I, I mean, lately given the position I've just gotten with the state police, I've had people who I've known for 30 years looking at me kind of like, okay, I don't trust you structurally, but you're my friend people I've grown up with in new fame. Um, so it's interesting. So when I say this, I, I want you to bear that in mind. I think people just do not trust the legislature. And I think that this particular interaction is going to be hard for them. So what I would offer here um, is the, you probably, I mean, you, I know you know, the, the law enforcement modernization document, the so-called 10 point plan that has been going around that has been getting it's really fun it's really like a palimpsest isn't it you know people keep writing on top of it and there are interesting meanings that get generated because people people keep writing on top of it but it's very much a living document what i had hoped to do before this morning and didn't have the time to do was to do the exercise of taking s124 taking that document and putting them together and seeing what's there, what's not, what might go. And that was as an attempt to get that process equity going into S-124. I am very sorry to say, I, none of you asked me to do that. So I don't know why I'm feeling apologetic and guilty, but I am. Um, <laughs> that I wasn't able to take the time to do that exercise because I think it would have been wonderful insofar as that document really did get a fair amount of community feedback. I know that Tabitha Moore was able to take it to her people in the NAACP chapter in Rutland. I don't know if it went to Stefan Gillum 
in Brattleboro, but I would not be surprised if it did um, because we all know each other and I, Tabitha and Stefan are very close. Um, I brought it to the Racial Disparities Advisory Panel. I have pages of commentary from that panel on that bill, uh, bill on that document. Mm -hmm. And so I think it might be useful to look at where they come together for you. I don't know. I know that's a lot of time because I tried doing it. Um, I was like up till three this morning and I kind of went, okay, that was wasted because I didn't get anywhere. But I just want to offer to you, I'm a little buzzy right now because I'm living on coffee. But I think that that is a really useful way of getting the process equity going when people can't actually, for a variety of good reasons, be in this forum at this moment. Mm -hmm. The one thing from there that I would like to pull up other than this is that notion of community involvement that is so central. And in a sense, I've been speaking to already. Um, I would like, I, I'd like to suggest that the oversight panels that are described in the bill need to have some kind of teeth attached. Um, that's important. People of color, as I think everyone is aware, are often asked to serve on advisory panels or oversight panels or some kind of panel that has great optics and no teeth. And they're aware of that. And there's a great fatigue and bitterness about that kind of organization. So when in S124 it talks about models being put forth for these panels, I think I got that right. I've been reading so many things. I think it's in S24, it may be 124, it may be in something else I'm reading. Good God. Anyway, <laughs> but it's in there. There's something about models being put forth. And I would suggest that those models include some teeth. Um, I would also say I understand a discomfort with that and I share it to some extent because oftentimes we get people on who don't speak the same language in some ways that we do. Um, they don't have the same mores, the same sort of cultural functioning that we may have. They work very differently. That can be uh, daunting. It can be off-putting. It can be all of those things. I would suggest that that is what community involvement looks like. Mm -hmm. um, it's not going to be neat and clean and it, 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 it's not always going to be friendly and I think we all have to just learn to get comfortable with that that's really all I wanted to put forth to you today my failed effort and what community involvement and process equity could look like if we put these documents closer together I appreciate that very much. Uh, Representative Merwicki has a question for you. Uh, good morning, Eitan. Good to see good you. Good morning. Um, the other day at the at the joint hearing, you, you spoke also about uh, having some teeth. Can you be more specific of what you sure. mean by the, to this? I can, please. Um, I, it, it is one, here's an example. Let me give an example. Let's say there is a law enforcement officer who is accused of some sort of malfeasance. If this community body can simply comment on this and nothing more, can simply document, can tell stories, for instance, um, but has no part in actual disciplining or indeed decertification, that advisory function ends up feeling a bit optic and not particularly real. That is what I'm talking about, that sort of situation. 
to give the community teeth in this instance, to give them an actual voice in, in the situation that I'm proposing hypothetically uh, around discipline, around something even as far as decertification actually gives them the kind of voice that frankly we've all been looking for for a very, very long time. Does that help? Thank you, yes. You're welcome. Hal Colston. Um, good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, Etan. Um, just to follow up with um, what Mike shared, are you aware of any models out there in communities that have these kinds of oversight uh, responsibilities that have action related to it versus advisory? I am working on that right now. I'm in touch with a bunch of people, including one very interesting uh, model from Baltimore. And I'm looking at that further right now. And I will hopefully have more information on that as soon as I get some sleep. <laughs> Great. But I, I, sorry, I'm a little punchy. Um, but I, I, that is one place I wanted to go, yes. Great, thank That's you. That's a start. You're welcome. Um, I saw Rob LeClaire's hand, but it has gone down. Um, well, I, I took it down so I wouldn't forget, but if you are calling on me, ma Madam Chair. It's a good <laughs> idea to leave it up until I call on you because okay. I might forget that I saw it. <laughs> thank but you go ahead, that. Rob. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good morning, Doctor. How are you, sir? Fine, thank you. Um, you know, you're, you're raising a very interesting point. Oh, wow. I guess somewhat unfortunately at a very um, appropriate time because what's going on up in Burlington um, I think would be a perfect example of what you're talking about. Um, if, if you had the ability to sort of weigh in on things right now where they are, um, what would be a, a couple steps forward in your opinion that would help um, alleviate that situation going on up there. I mean, it seems like that you have a, a group of folks up there that are very committed to, well, having these law enforcement officers removed. However, all the processes and procedures that have been in place are, are in place um, would indicate something differently. How, how would we bridge that gap, you think? That is a question that will not fit into a soundbite, the great. answer to which will not. Uh, it's excellent. I feel like anything I'm gonna say is so woefully inadequate that I, it's, it's concerning that it will go on the record, but it sounds jejune, frankly, where my mind first went and uh, I'll just put it forth as jejune as it may be. Um, there is an absolute inability at this point for people to sit down in a room in any way that is facilitated. And facilitation is key here because reactive responses are absolutely, I, I, I just think they're destructive at this point. Um, there is not a lot of listening going on. I don't think that that's also both in both directions, but it may well be. I think I'm gonna just put it out there that there's some kind of seriously facilitated listening. And I mean that very formally that needs to take place. I would also go so far as to say, I think that needs to happen statewide. <laughs> because I think what's going on in Burlington is simmering in other locales around the state. Um, there needs to be some serious facilitated listening as a starting point. Uh, I was very impressed by, and I have brought this up over and over again, I sound like a broken record and to say that makes me sound like I'm very old, which I guess I am since no one has records anymore, but when the situation with Representative Morris happened, 
And the attorney general decided to put together a group, a series of fora around the state where people listened. I mean, there were some real serious structural considerations here. Um, he spoke hardly at all. Uh, it really was community members speaking. Law enforcement officers didn't speak. Um, they, there were rules about how they could speak and when they could speak. We, uh, I did this along with Curtis Reed of the Vermont Partnership for Fairness and Diversity and also with Tabitha Moore of the Rutland NAACP. And we all ended up just sort of, I was sort of the facilitator of record, but really all three of us were doing it. And it really fell into a spot where people were able to speak. I am still hearing from people a year later from that exercise. We're not done because of the pandemic, but I think something like that has to be a starting point. And it needs to be that formal. Mm. Excellent points. Thank you very much. Bob Hooper. Yes, excellent points. Am I unmuted? Yes. Um, Thank you. Keeping in mind that, as I recently admitted, English is not my primary language. Um, my front porch forum is sort of alive these days because living in the New North End, you have to go down past the police station to get into town unless you take a, a route around and you have to do that intentionally. And a lot of people are now saying, I don't drive that way anymore. I don't want to see that anymore. It's not helping anymore. Um, but it comes to the point that you've made a couple of times in my mind about what you mean when you say community in terms of participation and in terms of uh, an avenue for resolving the problem. People have said to me, those people don't represent me. And when you use the word broadly, in community, it can be either a narrow community or the broad community as a whole. How do we get the broad community to be inclusive? As you just said, effectively, the police who are part of the community were kind of eliminated from the last mm -hmm. thing. Uh, and how do we not focus it on such a narrow community that people feel excluded? Mm -hmm. And that is excellent and an excellent point. I would say that from the outset, that would be one of the things that would be a fundamental question in forming these kind of the series of fora would be how do we put something together like that? I would suggest it would mean each person gets X amount of time to speak that after they speak, there are no responses allowed to it, something like that. This is coming off the cuff, Representative. I'm like, you know, this is something that really requires a far more uh, dedicated work group to sit and talk to. But that would be a that would be something off the top of my head that would start, so that people feel that the that what they say is not immediately fodder for an attack. May I? And I think we're all coming off the cuff because it's either an issue that we've been intentionally avoiding, intentionally unaware of, or uh, ill-prepared to address directly. Um, sure. But there is so much distrust that yes. getting to that point is very difficult. Absolutely. And that's also why I'm sort of really getting obsessive about how you structure something like this. That is the sort of thing, as I'm sure you're well aware, that mediators do, that they spend an enormous amount of time structuring events like this, precisely to allow people who feel marginalized in any way to speak. It really, mediators who are, you know, professional mediators do a lot of how do we put the ground rules together so that the community is as broadly defined as it can possibly be. And I would suggest that that's where things need to start. Hal Colston. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanna build on what Etan just shared about the listening process. Uh, I really believe it should be formalized 
as a Truth and Reconciliation Commission that should be statewide, that should have state partners and be fully funded to be effective. Um, and to Representative Leclerc's question, I think what we're experiencing in Burlington is just the tip of the iceberg in response to those three officers. The 90% of the iceberg we don't see is a flawed process for holding officers accountable. That's what's broken. Mm -hmm. So if, if, we give, if, if we just give default to, well, the process says they're exonerated, it's a broken process. And that's where the real work needs to be done. And I think an oversight uh, process of, of citizens can offer an incredible wisdom and uh, 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 just, just give it shape so that it's effective and, and that officers act in a responsible way. Uh, so this is, uh, and, and, and to Representative Hooper's point about community and people diverting because you know that doesn't speak to them. Well, that speaks to white people feeling comfortable. And, and, and if we're gonna maintain that, we're not gonna change. This is an uncomfortable issue. And if white folks can't go there, then we'll protest until, you know, whatever. It's, it's just the nature of where we are today. And as I've said to my colleagues before, people of color, black and brown people are not asking for change. We are demanding change. And it's not gonna be comfortable and status quo anymore. Thank you. And an, and an interesting point to that, if I may also piggyback on your piggybacking, is um, this happened in Japan. I have a very, well, few close friends who are of Korean descent who live in Tokyo. Um, and they went through a very, uh, they went through reparations. It didn't work. It, it absolutely didn't work. Because now when people who are of Korean descent start talking about racism, a lot of people look and go, you got your money, what are you still talking about? And if anyone thinks that's not gonna happen in the United States, I just start laughing because I'm like, oh, please, seriously? I, I mean, you know, this is a country in which everything is fungible. So I think the truth and reconciliation model is absolutely where we need to go. And one of the things that certainly happened in South Africa when that was implemented was a tremendous amount of discussion about discomfort. That's where things started. Everybody like went, hi, this isn't going to be fun, okay? Fun will happen later, actually, when we get to moments of actual understanding. But this is not gonna start easily. You're not gonna like wanna give hugs. It's just that, you know, so get that off the table, right? Let's just get that off the table. It's going to be uncomfortable, accept it. And even saying that was a tremendous step forward in getting that process going. And I just, I, I you represent, I'm, it's just so wonderful to hear someone say that because I really feel like that is exactly where we need to go, not merely as a state, but as a nation. We're blessed here that we're small enough that we can do it as a state. Yes, I appreciate some of the many advantages of having a small state where we know our neighbors and where, you know, when when you're in the snowbank in the dead of night in January, um, you know, any one of your neighbors is going to come and help you out. So, yeah, um, <clears throat> uh, Mike Merwicki has his hand up. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'm continuing in this thread that's going and I appreciate what um, Representative Colson shared. Um, my friend speaks my mind when he talks about a formal structure. And uh, what I'd like to do right now is, is, is share a quote from some reading I did recently that just jumped off the page and I think speaks to this moment. It's from Brené Brown. And uh, she's a researcher who lives in Houston. She writes, he or she who chooses comfort over courage in facilitating real conversations 
in towns and cities and areas you need it, when you choose your own comfort over trying to bring people together and you're a leader, either a civic or a faith leader, your days of relevance are numbered. Mm. Representative, do you have my email address? Could you send that to me, please? Thank you. I, I, I really I sure I need that. Thank you. That's yeah. exactly it. Bob Hooper. Mm. Uh, thank you. Uh, I don't know where we are in the piggyback stage, but I'll piggyback on how also <laughs> 15th removed. Uh, how you mentioned the word comfort, and I think we do it a disservice if we don't mention fear also. Um, that seems to be a driver for a lot of people. And if we all stood up and <clears throat> turned around and looked at the thing we're sitting in, uh, these chairs are the things that uh, create the change because there is nothing that can happen in contract that can supersede the law. So change exists here, the potential for anyway. Committee members. Uh, we are having a sort of an open discussion, but also asking Eitan questions as we go. Um, and I would like to invite Ann Donahue to, uh, to come into this conversation. I know that she's been listening and I, I've seen occasional nods of agreement with some of the, some of the words that folks have said. So um, Ann, I would love for you to share your thoughts with us and Eitan, if you can, uh, stick around. Um, that would be great as well, because I think we're uh, we're enjoying the 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 dialogue here and getting a lot of good information out of it. So welcome, Ann Donahue. Yes, it's um, it's a great conversation, and what it brings to mind uh, for me, which I think is reflected in a lot of what this bill is trying to do, is you know this is. This is, this is far beyond a training issue. This is really, this really gets to culture on all levels, culture within the police, but on, on all levels. And um, I actually had a pretty, to me, stunning interaction with my local police chief just about a week ago. And part of the reason it was stunning is it, it didn't have anything to do with implicit bias. The, that overlay would have just, um, you know, kind of really blown things uh, off, but I, I was involved purely as a support person for a constituent who had had um, a very personally distressing um, interaction with the police from the perspective of being a domestic abuse um, victim. Um, and so we met with the chief who said, you know, I've got an open door. If there are problems, um, talk with me. Um, and, and the bottom line was he acknowledged that the officer uh, in question um, had a very poor ability to interact well with, uh, with people, with victims, with community members. But this officer is like top-notch investigator, so very valuable to the department. Um, what he said then was, you know, when someone's gotten to be 35 years old, you know, you really can't change who they are or their personality. Um, this officer didn't break any policies. Um, there isn't anything I can do as the supervisor for this officer. It's, it's who this person is. It's just the way they are. And, and this officer, in fact, has been involved in an earlier incident um, in Northfield um, that did involve um, bias and that's been um, very problematic in the community. And, and I think the response was similar with that individual. So, um, you know, the, the bottom line of the, the, the culture within our police departments and the need for that citizen involvement um, in um, helping um, not just to look at things that happen, but to have an involved role in uh, what are our expectations for change? You know, this, this is not acceptable to say, well, it's the way the person is. We can't change them. Um, so, um, so it's been a, a great discussion to be able to hear. And, and of course, I come at it 
also recognizing how um, how deeply this affects the issues of interactions in the uh, psychiatric survivor mental health community in terms of the, the bias and discrimination that happens in uh, addressing those issues. Thank you, Anne. I, um, I appreciate you bringing that story to the forefront because um, if we think of other uh, public employees who interact with us, um, you wouldn't expect that kind of a dismissive statement about a school teacher or a firefighter or a snowplow driver. <laughs> um, and so um, the strange and, uh, and dangerous lack of accountability, um, oversight, responsibility, um, when it when we're talking about a law enforcement officer is um, is very troubling. And I think the point about um, the ability to listen and hear is really critical because um, this victim also had concerns about how she was dealt with by the chief who had arrived on the scene. And, uh, and the chief, you know, who was saying, you know, I want to be a listening person, I'm listening response was to explain why he said what he said to her. He was completely unable to understand that what he needed to recognize and how he needed to respond was to say, you know, this is why I said what I said. I didn't realize you would hear it that way. I'm really sorry that it had that impact on you. He wasn't remotely able to go there or understand the need um, to say that. So she was left, of course, feeling, um, you know, very uh, dismissed. And hearing and listening are two different things. <laughs> Madam Chair, if I may, just a couple more comments about where I think things might want to go, given that we're talking about conversation. Um, when Tabitha Moore, in a meeting that we were having around those, the 10 point plan that I've mentioned this morning, um, came back with, con with uh, comments from her constituency. It was very interesting that there were three items not on that plan and also not in S-124 that, um, communities of color, minoritized communities in general, frankly. Um, and I, I say that as <laughs> being a member of the uh, neurodivergent community as well, um, didn't feel were considered and felt like they, her people didn't even wanna have a conversation about the 10 points until these other three things were covered. And they were complex and they're awkward. They are the role of unions, defunding, and of course that's defined about 12 billion different ways, um, and qualified immunity. What was interesting when this discussion happened was that <laughs> everybody who likes one another, who was on this, I, I wanna say in this meeting, but of course I mean in whatever it is we're doing right now, um, we're all friends, even though we haven't seen each other in about a year. Um, everybody kind of quietly went to their corner. And being an anthropologist of sorts, I went, now, isn't this interesting that we're all going to our corners? What this says to me is this is where the rubber meets the road. So what was interesting was the law enforcement officers were very clear. Legally, we cannot even discuss unions. We legally cannot have that conversation right now because of collective bargaining. I thought that was fascinating. I said, isn't this interesting? This is where people are saying we need to go and you can't even go there and it has nothing to do with your individual agency. That's fascinating. So what I keep saying and have really been saying since 
I don't even know when, but certainly since May 25th, is some discussion needs to happen around those three issues. Those two will be uncomfortable discussions. As law enforcement officers say all the time, and I have to admit, and I will openly say this, I understand what they're saying. They can't do their jobs without qualified immunity. What would be the impulse if your house may go? And maybe it's not even because you actually did something that's ethically questionable. We live in a very litigious society. Without there being some kind of massive tort reform, that's a crazy proposition. But here's also the issue. I don't think most people out there know what a tort is. So there's a lot of work to be done here. So while I love a lot of what's in S24, while I love a lot of what's in the 10 point plan, as I, and as I've said to you this morning, I'd love somebody to have hours and lots of coffee to like put them together and see what comes up. Um, there are three things that are not here that historically minoritized communities think are essential for this conversation. I am not someone who's going to excoriate unions. Um, I, I, I just won't. I think that uh, protecting blue collar people in particular is extraordinarily important in this culture. On the other hand, it's not a one or a zero. Um, situations can also arise where those same self same organizations can cover sorts of various sorts of malfeasance and we've seen that. So that discussion needs to happen and anything that's going to go along with truth and reconciliation. You're going to have to go through at least those three issues. And as wonderful as I say, as I think S124 and that 10 point plan are, they are incomplete. And for some people, they're even beside the point. Yeah. <laughs> you bring up a very good point um, and one that I've gone back and forth about uh, quite a bit as I, uh, you know, through the course of the, the three public hearings that we had, we heard a number of um, a number of suggestions of things that needed that that folks feel needed to happen. Um, and you know, it is it is a, a limitation of a citizen legislature that we we can't do the you know it takes a tremendous amount of planning and ramp up time to do the whole package right. all at once. Yeah, um, we can in ordinary times much more um, right. systematically you know. Uh, take take one bill that has a chunk of concepts in it and move that through the process and then come back with another. Um, and then there's a layered on top of the normal citizen legislature challenges, there's the fact that we're in COVID times. <laughs> and, um, and so in some ways, this the fact that we're here in session today is uh, is a bonus because ordinarily we would have adjourned in May and the energy of this moment, um, which is rightfully demanding reform, would be focused on preparing for bills to be introduced in January and, uh, and trying to build coalitions of people who can come together and push reforms in January. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, we're at this moment where we have only a, a few small pieces right. that we can do. Right. Um, but I think many of us recognize the interconnectedness of a lot of these issues um, and perhaps most foundationally this truth and reconciliation um, process that needs to have its own time and consideration in front of a citizen legislature in order to be put in place in a way that really works here. Um, you know, if if we had a magic wand, we might cause these things to come into being all, you know, all at once. Um, but, but we don't, and we are a citizen legislature, and most of us are um, trying desperately to juggle our our day jobs uh, alongside 
um, being in session in September, which is a very odd sort of dynamic. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it leaves okay. us with a finite, um, a finite piece of work in front of us. And I just, you know, I only say this to point out, um, although I, I hope that folks know this already, that this isn't the only this bill that we have in front of us isn't the only thing that we need to do. In fact, um, uh, you know, police reform as a as a category is not the only uh, reform we need to do. Um, and so, I hope that folks will continue to engage with us and continue to reach out and and share their thoughts with members of this committee and their own House members and senators in Vermont. Um, because I really do believe that um, that elected officials across the political spectrum want to get this right for our communities. Mm -hmm. um, Anne Donahue, did you have any um, any specific observations about the <clears throat> about any sections of 124 that you wanted to share with us today? Uh, I did. I actually I have a narrow specific ask. I have a, a, a generic a generic thing I wanted to say about it and uh, and then a narrow ask. So I mean the generic thing is I think these are all crucial issues obviously and, and the one thing um, sort of to remind everyone three years ago we did pass a bill creating uh, the Mental Health Crisis Response Commission which had an explicit charge to um, look at deaths or serious bodily injury and come out of come out with recommendations about ways to prevent those things. Um, it's done its first report on the on the uh, Phil Brennan uh, shooting. And um, if you haven't already, I strongly recommend that you hear from the chair of the commission um, and the response in terms of what ways the bill uh, does and doesn't get at some of the things that the commission would recommend. Um, towards reforms. So, um, you know, in, including making sure that we include the issues around mental health um, are really important in the bill. I'd be happy to work, um, you know, individually with anybody on pieces of the language. Um, you know, almost at least half of our deaths and more in the last, uh, the huge increase in the last couple of years have all related to a person in a mental health crisis. Um, the specific ask, it's one of those things like, you know, when somebody says something and five minutes later you say, oh, I had the perfect comeback. Why didn't I think of it on the spot? So you're, you would be well, it would be a good question for you to ask me, why didn't you think of suggesting this in June? Um, didn't think of it. Um, you passed a bill in uh, June, we passed a bill, Act 147, uh, and it included a component about um, if data isn't turned in that's required, um, that will affect your ability to get funding from the state. And there is another piece of data that is required uh, from law enforcement that I think um, has been problematic as to whether that is occurring. I would love to see a little amendment that added that statutory requirement to the language that you created about uh, budgets. I did send in for you, you have a, a copy that shows the bill, uh, the Mental Health Crisis Response Commission um, statute requires uh, law enforcement to report within 60 days any interaction that has resulted in death or serious bodily injury. And the last time I talked to the Attorney General's office, um, they did not feel that that uh, was really happening. I don't think there had been a single report of a serious bodily injury case in the three years since, and it's hard to imagine there haven't been any at all. Um, so it would be a, a simple um, uh, piece of language that I've shown on the handout there adding uh, to um, Act 147's language, um, compliance with race data reporting requirements set forth in 20 BSA 2366 and with the death or serious bodily injury reporting requirements 
um, set forth in 18 VSA 7257A. Great, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate you um, sharing your thoughts and if you have any other aha moments, um, you know how, where to find us. <laughs> We're right down much. the hall. <laughs> All right, committee members, any other questions for Representative Donahue or Do Dr. Nasreddin Longo? Because at this point, I would like to switch gears and invite Betsy Ann to, um, to share some, uh, some information with us to help us put the, um, the reform components that are in this bill and, and that we have been talking about sort of into the broader context of, uh, of uh, what is currently in statute. And um, Eitan and Ann, you're welcome to, to stay and listen if you like. Um, and uh, we'll turn it over to Betsy Ann for, um, for one of her wonderful tutorials. Thank you. Hello, and thank you. Uh, good morning, Betsy Ann Rask, Legislative Council. And thanks for those witnesses testifying so far. I, I did wanna pick up on one thing that Dr. Nasreddin Longo was mentioning about the three issues, just to follow up on that. Um, for the role of unions, um, which really is more addressing a labor or employment issue. And that is not, that is not contained in S-124. I'll point out one thing in regard to current law in the council chapter about how law enforcement agencies do have to have a degree of civilian oversight, which does go to an employer employee issue. Um, but that's current law. So we'll circle back to that. Um, the funding, this bill does not address funding on the state level or municipal level. And then the qualifying of unity, I think you've been working with uh, Bryn from more of a judiciary issue to address those issues. I'm just trying to lay out where things are right now um, to talk more about what this bill is currently set up to do in regard to law enforcement. It's more currently focused on the state's professional regulation of law enforcement officers, what goes into their training what an officer needs to do to get certified, but then also the state's regulation of law, for law enforcement officers on a statewide level and enforcing the statewide standards of unprofessional conduct that are currently set forth in the law. And this bill does address the entity, the Criminal Justice Training Council that has the authority over training and certification and professional discipline on an officer's certification statewide. And so one thing I would mention as we'll go through the uh, contents of the bill is that one of the proposals in the bill is to address who are the members of the council who have the overall oversight of the training and certification standards and the decision-making in regard to disciplining an officer's certification that enables an officer to practice as a law enforcement officer. Because that the bill does uh, propose to change the entities who have that overall oversight authority on the statewide level. Going back to the first issue in regard to more of the employer employment relationship um, and this relates to civilian oversight. I will note now in current law, uh, pursuant to Act 56, which set really beefed up the professional regulation of law enforcement officers. Um, so to summarize, Act 56 does generally provide, and our law currently provides, that when there is a complaint about an officer's conduct, alleged unprofessional conduct, generally, it's the law enforcement officer's own agency that conducts an investigation and submits an investigative report to the council for the council to consider 
whether to take action against the officer certification so that would impact where the officer can practice anywhere in the state. Part of the current law's process um, for an agency to investigate alleged unprofessional conduct by one of the agency's officers is that the agency has to conduct what's defined as a valid investigation. And there are standards for a valid investigation. And one of the standards is that uh, the agency has to have what's called an effective internal affairs program which is also a defined term and an effective internal affairs program does contain different um, criteria and one of them is civilian review um, and that's defined in statute in 20 VSA 2401 subdivision 4 E Civilian review is currently defined as a requirement for the agency to provide for review of officer discipline by civilians, which may be a select board or other elected or appointed body, at least for the conduct required to be reported to the council under the council's unprofessional conduct subchapter. So perhaps as this committee is considering this bill and pursuing these issues in the bill, um, one of the things perhaps that you could take testimony on is what this is looking like in practice and how agencies are implementing this requirement to have civilian review. Understanding that um, there are differences among the municipalities, for example, of how uh, civilians get to participate in that review of the discipline that the agency might impose on the officer. That's just something to hold in mind for further discussion in this uh, committee. Beyond that current law effective internal affairs program, another thing that is in current law under the council is the requirement for the council to have what's called a council advisory committee. This is set forth in current law in 20 VSA 2410. This is a five member committee. Um, it's currently structured as advisory only, but it is to be composed of five individuals appointed by the governor. Um, and four of those members are required to be public members who don't have a law enforcement connection and one a retired law enforcement officer. And that council advisory committee was created in law to provide advice to the council regarding its duties in uh, regulating officers professional conduct. Um, but it is advisory. One of the things that S124 would do, and we can, we'll look further at this um, in this draft uh, strike all that we have going for committee discussion is that it would require on page 14 of that annotated strike all that I put together for you, a specific requirement that when an agency does provide its investigative report and supporting documents to the council after the agency has investigated alleged unprofessional conduct of an officer, there would be a specific requirement for the council to provide a copy of that investigative report to the council advisory committee and a requirement for the council to recommend any appropriate action to take in regard to the law enforcement officer. So that is at least one element of further civilian review of alleged unprofessional conduct, but note it is still advisory only, but giving advice to the council overall as the council uh, is the adjudicating body of charges of an officer's unprofessional conduct. That third element, uh, a third uh, issue relating to civilian oversight is the council membership itself, as I mentioned, and S-124 as passed the Senate would amend the council membership um, to include more non-law enforcement related individuals as members of the council. 
including adding the commissioner of mental health as a member of the council, the executive director of racial equity, and also specific BLCT appointment, um, but they would have an eye more, I would think as to law enforcement, municipal law enforcement agencies, but also an individual appointed by the director for the Center for Crime Victim Services, um, the executive, a person appointed by the executive director of the Human Rights Commission, a person appointed by the executive director of the Vermont Network Against Dem Domestic and Sexual Violence, and then three public members appointed by the governor who don't have a law enforcement connection. So those members would be added to the current Criminal Justice Training Council, which again is established to set the statewide standards for all law enforcement officers, training, certification, and the regulation of their professional conduct. Um, that would be the council is the entity that if an officer is charged with violating the statewide standards of unprofessional conduct, that's the body that adjudicates those charges and determines whether unprofessional conduct occurred, and if so, the discipline to impose on an officer's certification, which is the officer's authority to practice as an officer anywhere in this state. And that disciplinary authority could include um, suspension or uh, revocation of an officer's certification to practice. John Gannon has a question. Thank you. Um, Betsy Ann, if you know, with these proposed amendments um, with to the council, what would be the balance um, on the council between law enforcement and non-law enforcement? All right, I don't have the numbers offhand. The council would be going from 12 members to 20, but I can count them out now. Um, Commissioner of Public Safety, we'll call that law enforcement related. Yep. Commissioner of Corrections, they don't have law enforcement officers, but more on the justice side. Commissioner of Motor Vehicles, they have law enforcement officers. Fish and Wildlife, they have the game wardens who are law enforcement officers. Commissioner of Mental Health, um, so I would put that in the opposite category. The AG, where do you want to put the AG? More law enforcement related as the chief law enforcement officer. The executive director of the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, again, a law enforcement related position, that's six. Executive director of racial equity, I put that as two on the more public side. Uh, Troopers Association appointee, law enforcement. Police Association appointee, law enforcement. Chiefs of Police Association, Law Enforcement, Sheriff's Association, Law Enforcement, that's 10. Uh, VSEA appointee, who is a law enforcement officer, that's 11. Yep. VLCT, where would you put them? I think they have more, I don't know what their perspective, I can't speak for them, but whether they would have more of a perspective of municipal law enforcement agencies, I don't know where, where would you put them? Well, I would predict that they might have a municipal law enforcement officer <laughs> appointed yep. to that. <laughs> yeah, it's actually an employee of VLCT, but they do have a focus on municipal affairs, which I would infer is more law enforcement related. We can call them 12 for now. Um, Executive Director of Crime Victim Services, I'd put them on the non-law enforcement side, that's three. Someone appointed by a Human Rights Commission, that's four. Um, executive director appointee uh, appointed by the executive director of network against domestic and sexual violence i'd call that five and then the three public members is eight so if we're counting correctly that's uh eight non-law enforcement to 12 uh, law enforcement related thank you um the other issue related to civilian oversight that the doctor referenced in S-124 currently, there is a requirement um, in multiple uh, reports back with recommendations in regard to law enforcement 
there is a specific, and this is, we'll get into this in the annotated strike all, but this is starting on uh, page 16. Um, there is a requirement for the Office of Attorney General to consult with a variety of stakeholders and interested parties to uh, recommend one or more models of civilian oversight of law enforcement. Um, so that that could be addressed in the future based on what those recommendations are. Um, the AG's office did come to testify in Senate GovOps uh, about potential models or different structures of models of civilian oversight. So this bill would require um, further review and recommendation on that issue. And then relatedly, there is um, more report back about um, people being able to make, if whether there should be a certain place that individuals should be able to uh, make complaints in regard to law enforcement alleged unprofessional conduct. Um, right now, the two main resources are the law enforcement agency itself and the council, at least as far as it goes to alleged unprofessional conduct um, provisions. That's just kind of just um, kind of giving a lay of the land in regard to those issues you've discussed so far. In regard to civilian oversight. I'll pause here. Is are there any questions on that so far? John Gannon. So this isn't really a question, it's just a comment. It seems with respect to models of civilian oversight, we are again handing law enforcement, i.e. the attorney general, the responsibility for identifying those models. Um, and the same with respect to reporting allegations of law enforcement misconduct. Um, so I, I just make that comment. Good point. Marsha Gardner. So I'd just like to suggest that we review the members of the Criminal Justice Training Council to see if we could create perhaps more balance on uh, that council or at least have that discussion. Can we create a 10-10 balance on that uh, council? Thanks, Marcia. Then I'll just uh, note, in regard to Representative Donahue's proposed amendment, actually, if, if there's a similar um, provision in S-124 in regard to a law enforcement agency needing to be in compliance with state policies in order to uh, be able to enjoy the services of the council, their training, uh, for example, so that sounded similar to what Representative Donahue brought up about amending S, the provisions of S-219 now enacted in the law in regard to um, a, a law enforcement agency getting state resources as long as they're in compliance with state policy. So I'll just mention that they seem related to those two issues, similar. Uh, Marsha. Thank you. Uh, talk, speaking of these uh, funds that are available for different um, law enforcement agencies around the state, I've been told, and I don't know if this is true, but I've been told that these funds are limited and that they, for the most part, go to the larger agencies around the state and that they run out quite quickly. So I think I'd like to hear more about um, those funds and, um, you know, are there enough funds to really create some kind of incentive there? Marsha, let's talk about, um, about how, we, how we get the right voices in to, to, um, to help us understand the way that dynamic is working. So you and I and Andrea can figure out who we invite. 
Um, Bob Hooper. On that point, I don't know the answer to this, but the federal stuff that comes in, the tanks and missiles and everything else, does that go through this particular type of allocation screen or is that a different application process that maybe we might want to look at? That's a good question. Yeah, it seems related um, to what a representative Gardner just brought up. Um, perhaps if you're wanting to pursue that, uh, the secretary of administration or someone under the secretary could testify in regard to how that grant, that granting program works. Um, just looking at your the provisions of the enacted S-219 and that amendment to um, the requirement that the Secretary of Administration or designee have to review grants from the age, from an agency of the state to a local law enforcement agency to um, and re, uh, review that grant prior to granting it to the agency um, to ensure that the agency is in compliance with state policies. Uh, um, Dr. Nasred and Longo, um, the RDAP did some work on this recently. Yes, Madam Chair, we were. Um, asked to testify earlier in the summer about uh, what I sort of call the funding for data exchange that you know you have to have your la as a municipal law enforcement agency have the last six months of your race data uh, together before the funding you know these grants would come through. One issue that came up over and over again on the RDAP and I have to say I'm behind, is the fact that it reinforces the idea that you basically have to have money to get money. Um, people were talking about how, you know, VSP does this. I'm very familiar as the, well now, co-director of fair and impartial policing and community affairs for the agency. Um, I know how that happens. Betty Wheeler does this. She does this because she finds it fun. I know there are people who find stats enjoyable. She's one of them. But she really, this is a sideline for her. We would really be lost if Betty didn't just enjoy doing it and wasn't brilliant at it. Um, to use that as a gold standard is somewhat concerning. Um, quite right that the larger agencies get the money. They've got the people who can do it. The concern on this part of the RDAP was what do we do with the other, what, 70 agencies around the state that have four people? It's not an easy process collecting and collating this data and certainly doing it accurately. The first few years of this initiative um, for the VSP were disastrous. Um, and so, we were very concerned on the RDAP that this was coming through without any sense of funding these smaller agencies to give them help in actually being able to do what the statute was requiring them to do. Mm -hmm. That is an important point. And um, so, yeah, Marsha, let's keep uh, let's keep looking at this. So Betsy Ann, we will um, come back to you now, unless committee members want to dive in with a question. Okay. Well, Madam Chair, if it makes sense, perhaps one thing that we could look at is this uh, draft strike all that is just keeping track of your conversations to date. Um, it's posted on your website. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, let's see how it's listed. It's the HGO amendment annotated. And just to note, so this is just a draft for committee discussion. Um, it contains the technical corrections that you've discussed to date. 
Um, and some of those technical corrections are just the uh, using the term law enforcement applicant instead of recruit. Also, the um, eliminating language that duplicates what you the General Assembly already enacted in S219 as was enacted. And then also a technical correction was in regard to clarifying that requirement for following the body camera policy being right now if the agency uses body cameras. So it includes those technical corrections. Um, it also just points out some of the similarities with 2018 S273, which passed both bodies but was vetoed. Um, which, and if I'm recalling correctly, it was due in part to the membership, the proposed membership of the council at that time. And then also pointing out some of the similarities with S219 and actually in at least one place, it looks like there needs to be some uh, harmonization between the two in regard to who has ultimate authority to set the body camera policy standards. So if members are, are, is it okay if members pull up the draft on their own so we don't do screen share, yep. we can stay together? Does do that folks work? have a second device nearby so they can grab the annotated draft? Okay. All right, so just again, putting this together as just a running tab of your potential amendments that you've discussed to date. And it's that draft 1.1 annotated um, with the 9-1 date. So in section one, there's your potential technical correction. Um, this would use the term law enforcement applicants instead of recruit, how statute currently refers to recruits. And just also helping to clarify that law enforcement applicants have to go through basic training. That's the initial training that they must complete in order to get initially certified as a law enforcement officer by the council. And then that once certified officers have to take in-service training. Then moving on. Uh, section two amends the council membership as we were discussing. So it would be going from a 12 member council to a 20 member council. And you can see the members that would be added. Um, just note, there's a separate statute that provides that each council member may appoint a designee to serve in their place. So you can see at the top of page two where it currently says under current law that the commissioners serve on the council. It's possible that a commissioner can appoint a designee to serve in the commissioner's stead um, on the council. But the first proposal is to add the commissioner of health to the council membership. Another proposal is to add the executive director of the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, and then also the executive director of racial equity. And then you can see that the bill goes down to eliminating the current five members appointed by the governor. You can see the current law language on 12 provides that the governor's appointees provide a broad representation of all aspects of law enforcement and the public in Vermont on the council. And the governor needs to solicit recommendations from certain entities. Instead of those five uh, members, generally, um, the, the bill would specify people in place of those five members, a uh, member of the Chiefs of Police Association the member of the Sheriff's Association. And just to note, there are people who might already be representing the Chiefs of Police Association, the Sheriff's Association on the council through the governor's appointment, but this would specify that these instead, that these people, these will be representatives on the council. I'm at the top of page three, a law enforcement officer appointed by the president of the VSEA, an employee of VLCT, appointed by VLCT's executive director, 
an individual appointed by the executive director of the Center for Crime Victim Services, an individual appointed by the executive director of the Human Rights Commission, so not the executive director herself, but someone appointed by her, an individual appointed by the executive director of the Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence, and then three public members appointed by the governor who cannot be a law enforcement officer or have spouse, parent, child, or sibling who is one, or current legislators, or otherwise be employed in the criminal justice system. So that's how that council membership is proposed to change. Um, down at the bottom, it provides, and it's essentially, uh, let's see, it provides specifically that the public members are entitled to receive per diem compensation via 32 VSA 1010, that's the standard $50 per diem, but that all members are entitled to receive reimbursement of expenses, and that is also the standard on the 32 VSA 1010, that's our standard uh, board member per diem statute um, that members generally get to get reimbursed for their expenses. And that would come from monies appropriated to the council. And section three would do this similar thing that what S273 uh, from last by name would have done is just would say if you're an existing member of the council and under this new membership, you would still get to participate and be a member of the council, then you could serve out the remainder of your existing term length. So does that effectively mean that the council in in theory going to 20 could for a short period of time have 22 or 24 members? Uh, no, it's saying that um, if under the new membership, if you're already serving, for example, as a governor appointee, as a representative of the Sheriff's Association, and now the Sheriff's Association gets to make an appointment instead of that governor appointee, and you're the, they appoint you again, um, you get just to continue to serve out your term. And I think the idea is that um, you don't have terms automatically uh, start over so that all the new terms don't expire at once. So you can kind of have some continuity in the uh, membership of the council. So it's Thank not a you. brand new turnover, yeah. So that goes to the membership. And just as a reminder, um, this bill gets into what the council's powers are in setting the training for officers and uh, the requirement that the council would have to adopt rules to identify and implement alternate routes to certification, aside from training at the police academy, because it really is focused on um, police academy training, which is a 16 week program if you wanna be a level three officer um, where there is uh, Monday through Friday overnight stays required and so there was, that was part of the discussion on the Senate side is um, whether there should be more options to get trained to become certified as an officer. And that language there um, on line 14 of page four is the same as what would have been enacted in S-273. And related to this is the requirement for the council to offer instructions for officers in different areas of the state and strive to officer, offer non-overnight courses when available, when possible. So I'm just continuing on to page four. There's the reminder about the requirement for the council to structure its programs so that a level two certified officer can get level three certification without having to start the certification process over again, which is the current uh, procedure um, in order to enable a person to go from level two to level three um, with some portfolio experience or that college level examination program, the CLEP testing. And that was similar to what was in S-273. And there's a required report back on how the council is doing in implementing those provisions in section six. And page seven in sub B 
uh, provides a rulemaking deadline for those uh, alternate routes to certification. So here in 6A, I looked back, I was, so I, was, I reviewed S219 as enacted to see whether there were similarities in the bills or even overlap. And so as we were discussing earlier, S219 has that language about uh, someone who's getting a state grant, a law enforcement agency or constable that's getting a state grant has to be in compliance with the race data reporting requirements. And this language in S124 is similar, but not the same in that this language requires an agency to be in compliance with state, um, the policy, re the requirement to collect roadside stop data. And it says also to adopt, follow, or, or enforce any policy under this chapter in order to get uh, use council services like training at the academy. Um, so it's similar, but different. It's still a goal of, of requiring in agency compliance with um, policies. Uh, some of the policies that are in the council chapter are the requirement to have a fair and impartial policing policy. And then also if your agency will use tasers, electronic control devices, there's also a separate policy that a person uh, officer must be in compliance with. Um, and this is where um, if you will pursue the proposal that Representative Donahue made, um, that's a separate um, policy that lives outside of the council chapter um, in regard to that Title 18 requirement for agencies to report uh, when a law enforcement officer is interacting with a person um, that it may be in a mental health crisis and uh, to report um, interactions that may have resulted in death or serious bodily inner injury. So if you wanna pursue that in both, you could pursue it in one or both places, it seemed similar. On page eight, this was more of a technical correction um, to bring statute up to speed with what's already happening in practice, which is that agencies can um, get approved by the council to offer training to officers of another agency and the S-273 would have done the same thing. Section eight contains that new requirement for a potential hiring agency to contact an officer's current agency and require that current agency to disclose its analysis of the officer's performance there. Um, and that's already a requirement. Um, if an officer is not employed at an agency, there's a requirement for the potential hiring agency to contact the former one. So this is adding in language about contacting the current one if an officer is still there. And at the top of page 10, that section nine contained a provision to state explicitly that that duty to disclose is uh, not uh, required if there's a bond binding non-disclosure agreement prohibiting that disclosure that was executed prior to the effective date of that section that's going back to the contractual labor issues. I don't know how, uh, how many non-disclosure agreements there might be in that regard, but that was also the language that was used when this requirement was first enacted for agencies to contact the former agency. That seems an important um aspect of this landscape for us to understand a little more. So um, if we could dig in to that a bit more next week, that would be helpful. I think it would. I, potential witnesses, um, maybe that could, would be some information that VLCT could provide uh, for this committee about those types of agreements, or I'm not sure. Her, sure who would be the best witness to testify to what these types of, uh, what type of agreements currently exist. We'll have to think more about that. Okay, so on page 10 is that potential technical 
what we think I think is a potential uh, technical correction to that body camera language. Um, so as I understood it, and as I think this committee understands it, that that requirement to comply with a body camera policy only applies if an agency actually is using body cameras or an officer is authorized to use a body camera and not a requirement for all law enforcement agencies to use a body camera. So with that understanding, which I, we discussed, um, I have updated or drafted potential amendments to this language to make it clearer that the requirement to comply with the body camera policy only applies if an agency and officers are actually using body cameras. So that it's not a read at all to be a requirement for all officers to use body cameras. This is separate from what you did in S219, which was in um, included language about um, Vermont or Department of Public Safety officers, a requirement for them to use body cameras. So this language would say beginning on January 1, 22, each law enforcement agency that authorizes its officers to use body cameras shall adopt, follow, and enforce the LEAB's model bot body camera policy. And each law enforcement officer who uses a body camera shall comply with the provisions of that policy. One thing I just noted here in the notes for you is that there does appear to potentially be some conflict between this and the language that you passed in S219, which is now Act 147, because in Section 1, which described the issues that the General Assembly committed to further working on, um, the legislature committed to working on reviewing the LEAB and ACLU's model body camera policies and the ledge committed to working on developing a statewide policy for adoption prior to the effective date of section seven, which contained Department of Public Safety's requirement for all of its officers to use body cameras. And that effective date is October 1st, 2020. So there, it seemed like the General Assembly was saying that the General Assembly itself was going to adopt a body camera policy Whereas here, this language would be saying that any agencies that use a poli uh, body camera have to comply with the LEAB's model policy. So it seems like there needs to be some decision as to who is going to um, have the authority to um, adopt a policy that agencies have to use um, when they're using body cameras. Yes, we do need to figure that out. Yeah, here, so LEAB already has its body camera policy. It was required to come up with one pursuant to that 2016 act. And you'll see further in the bill that this bill would require LEAB to um, review its policy and uh, amend it um, with the idea that they would make any uh, revisions to it before this new requirement takes effect for all agencies that use body cameras to follow the LEAB policy. So it's something further to discuss there. Moving on to page 11, um, this would have amended the uh, definition of what constitutes unprofessional conduct. Um, with the bill S-124, the major change being on page 12 which would have said category B conduct shall include the current law list instead of saying there's examples of category B. And then also importantly, that it's excessive use of force first offense rather than second offense that constitutes unprofessional conduct, which had a rippling effect throughout the chapter. But you already made those amendments in S219, so you don't have to address them again here. You've covered that. so this is red strike through is to show that you've already addressed this issue. Uh, just a reminder on page 13, that language about 
the um, when an agency has to report alleged category B conduct to the council, it's when the agency receives a credible report instead of the current law language that says agency reports it after the agency has already gone through a whole valid investigation and then determined that the complaint is credible. So under this language, it's essentially saying after a pre-screen and the complaint is credible, then it reports it to the council. The agency itself would still go through its process of conducting investigation and then submitting its final investigative report to the council. But this change in the language would allow the council to be more aware of credible, credible complaints up front. So it would have more oversight over the uh, agency's investigation of it. So committee, this is one area where I'd love to um, uh, explore how this works with our smaller municipal agencies, because as you can imagine, uh, if you're in a, a two or three or four person uh, municipal law enforcement agency, the, the people you work alongside um, who you might be having to uh, look at a complaint against uh, are probably also the people you go to the Saturday afternoon cookout with and uh, your children play together and whatnot and whatnot. So, you know, I think it's worth um, exploring whether there is a more comfortable uh, way of offering that sort of first blush uh, review of a complaint um, that doesn't pit uh, colleagues and friends against each other in a small town setting. And related to that, Madam Chair, I'll just note that the current law in the Council on Professional Conduct chapter in 20 VSA 2404, which addresses investigations, does put the onus on each agency to investigate complaints about alleged law enforcement officer unprofessional conduct. And the only exception at least written into the law right now is that there's a requirement for an agency to refer to the council any unprofessional conduct complaints made against an officer who is the executive officer of that agency, the highest ranking officer, so that the agency is not needing to investigate its own boss. But it would, I think it'd be good to yeah, get more testimony from the council on how this investigation process is working in practice and whether it, I, I believe it's they're able in practice and they have in practice been able to refer investigations to separate agencies like VSP, but it'd be good to get just more testimony from the council on how that would, that actually works in practice for the smaller law enforcement agencies. Great, we'll, uh, we'll ask Andrea to schedule the council for later next week. Sounds good. So on uh, Rob LeClaire has a question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just curious, um, Betsy Ann, would there be anything about local collective bargaining agreements with law enforcement that could have some influence on this, you suppose? I, th I think we need to hear more. I'm just not an, I'm not an expert in that area and what is actually happening in practice. It is a current law requirement for agencies to investigate and report um, their investigations to the, the results of their investigation to the council. So that is a requirement since the council is the overall statewide entity um, with oversight over officer certifications. So agencies already have to conduct investigations and report the conclusions of them to the council. But where <clears throat> I think it's a good area for this committee to get um, more detail about any impediments to the current structure for conducting investigations um, due to any sort of labor agreements. I just don't have enough information on that to be able to address it for you in detail. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's a good question, Rob. We'll, uh, we'll do what we can to try to get a better understanding of the interaction between um, folks working conditions, contracts, and, uh, and oversight. Thank you, Madam Chair. So on page 14, um, on line seven, it does get into that 
civilian review aspect. Um, when an agency does report its uh, investigative report of alleged unprofessional conduct of an officer, um, it has to submit its investigative report to the council. And you can see that current law language on page 14, line three, um, that in the instances when they have to report to the council, they have to provide to the council a copy of any relevant documents associated with the report, including any findings, decisions, and the agency's investigative report. The new language that's proposed here is a specific requirement for the council to provide a copy of any investigative report and the relevant documents to that current law council advisory committee, which again is that five member um, gubernatorial appointed committee with the four public members and the fifth member being a retired officer. And that council advisory committee would be required to recommend to the council any appropriate action to take in regard to the officers who's the subject of the report. So that, that is at least one aspect of additional civilian review of complaints of unprofessional conduct committed by officers. At the bottom of this page in page 14, section 10A, the law enforcement specific provisions of this bill ends with follow-up recommendations by um, specified entities on a variety of topics that are listed here. And I just noted that this is similar to, but not the same as what S219 did which set forth the legislative intent for the General Assembly and its committees to continue to address many of these similar issues. But unlike that S219 language where the legislature was committing to further addressing issues, this requires specified entities to report back to the GovOps committees on various issues. And so on page 15, one of the issues is law enforcement officer qualifications with the LEAB and the Criminal Justice Training Council making recommendations on those. Law enforcement training, where the council would have to consult with um, different entities in uh, reporting on the appropriateness of their current training. Um, I did just highlight here um, that the council would have to look at its training and determine whether appropriate training is provided in the areas of cultural awareness, implicit bias, de-escalation, and also recognition of and appropriately responding to individuals with a mental condition. And I just noted that in S219, it did state that the General Assembly is committed to evaluating whether and how to gather data on interactions between officers and people who have mental health issues. So similar, um, but you've committed to further work in that area. On page 16, continuing on with this overall topic of officer training, um, one of the things that this bill would require back, a report back on is um, the council, the LEAB and the Department of Public Safety being required to consult with VLCT and other interested stakeholders to determine among other things, whether the council should be reestablished within a state agency or other oversight entity. And I just noted that I saw on S219 that the General Assembly committed to working on whether to resituate the council specifically under the jurisdiction of the Department of Public Safety. So there was a similarity there between the two. Number three on line 16 there, um, there's the language about the models of civilian oversight uh, where the AG's office would be required to consult consult with the council, the Human Rights Commission, VLCT, and other interested parties to recommend one or more models of civilian oversight of law enforcement. Off, uh, law enforcement. And then similar to what we were discussing earlier, um, reporting allegations of officer misconduct. Here, AG's office would be required to consult with the Council of Human Rights Commission, ACLU, and other interested parties in order to identify a central point for reporting allegations of officer misconduct, which may be the council or another entity and how those allegations should be handled. 
Uh, Hal Colston has his hand up. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Betsy Ann, in, in a couple instances, it talks about other interested parties. How do they get invited to the table? I think when the entities were talking about this in um, Senate GovOps, there was a general consensus that they would make sure that they were open when they were discussing these issues, that they'd uh, hold public hearings, for example. Um, I think it would be good to hear from these reporting entities about how they would involve other interested parties in practice so that this committee can understand how that would work and whether there needs to be any additional language about requirements um, to include other interested parties. But for example, with these, um, the council itself is a public entity, so it would need to hold um, public hearings in, um, or open meetings that people could attend. But what moves they would make to include people is probably better answered by them, um, what they would have planned in order to comply with that requirement. Thank you. Um, related to public oversight is number five, that access to complaint information where that council advisory committee would need to consult with the Secretary of State, Human Rights Commission, ACLU, and other interest parties in reviewing public access to records relating to allegations of officer misconduct and substantiations of those allegations in order to recommend any changes to current practice. Back to that body camera issue here in number six, there's a requirement for the LEAB to report any changes it deems necessary to its body camera policy that it established pursuant to that 2016 act. And then after consulting with specified entities, they would specifically recommend policies for responding to public records requests for body cam footage and recommended timelines on responding and how to redact footage and the length of footage retention and storage. And this is related to that um, language earlier in the bill that would require any uh, law enforcement agency using body cams to comply with the LEAB policy. And there I just made that note again that um, in S219, it appeared that the General Assembly it was considering in the future to adopt its own body camera policy. So just a reminder to look back at that issue and harmonize those two. And then finally, that military equipment issue on page 18, sub seven, um, the language provides after an opportunity, here's some specific language, Rep. Colston, um, related to your previous question. This specifically says, after an opportunity for community involvement and feedback, LEAB shall recommend a statewide policy on officers use of military equipment. Um, so there's potential model language if you want um, addressing what type of review needs to be made and how to involve the public. So that's the real law enforcement officer training and regulation provisions of the bill. Um, it does go on to address for the VCIC how to enter crime data and then the makeup of the LEAB, adding members to the LEAB, um, which are all, it is all more law enforcement focused and then a uh, report on uh, on page 22, lawn, uh, town access to law enforcement services. I will note I was in uh, House Ways and Means this morning. Um, they reviewed both, had, they had a high level overview of S-124 at the request of at least one of their members. And then I did a walkthrough of S-220, which they do have custody of. But I'll note here on this uh, bottom of page 22, one of the things that House Ways and Means took particular interest in is this dispatch rates issue, um, where right now this current language uh, would require the Commissioner of Public Safety to adopt rules that set forth the rates for the dispatch functions that it performs. Um, but with the three-year rollout, and I'll just note in the time we have left that they did express interest in pursuing that further. And I, as I understand it, 
um, if this bill will move out of committee, they would like to have custody of it thereafter um, in order to review that rate setting issue. Yes, I can uh, understand that. Um, committee members, any questions for Betsy Ann? All right, thank you, um, Betsy Ann, for running through um, all of those annotated um, comments on the first half of the bill. I appreciate that. Uh, Jim Harrison. Yeah, just be, um, before I forget, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Betsy Ann, there's a section that you just went over a few pages ago about consideration of the location change of the training academy. Um, what, can, can any insight as to what precipitated that? Um, uh, maybe I have a little bit of bias because it's not in my district, but it's right down the street. Uh, and uh, we certainly see um, law enforcement from many jurisdictions around the state uh, traveling through our district, which I for one certainly uh, appreciate. Um, it keeps me on my toes in terms of my speed limit. Um, but um, any sense as to where that came from? Yeah, the, so on page 16, line 10, um, whether the police academy should be re relocated to a different area of the state. Um, I, I think generally that was going to access to the academy um, to enable more people to pursue a career in law enforcement and whether that's just, that's the right area of the state to have the academy. I think that was the general idea, um, just concerned about access to training. Probably for more, a more direct answer, it would be good to hear from a representative of Senate GovOps about their specific concerns, um, which I, I can't specifically speak to. But I think it generally was about access to the training. Okay, thank you. All right, committee, any other questions? As we have been going through these sections, um, if you have been inspired to suggest someone's perspective you would like to hear on any of these suggestions, please do reach out to me. We have, uh, we have a basic structure for, uh, for a committee agenda next week, which will be pretty much solely focused on this bill. Um, and we can certainly try to fit in different uh, different perspectives um, within that structure for the next week. Um, so please do reach out to me. Um, and I'm sure that you could, uh, you could also reach out to our Senate counterparts if you're curious about who they heard from on any particular section. Um, all right, any other questions, comments, committee discussion? All right, so Representative Donahue, thank you for, for sticking with us this morning. Um, please do share any thoughts that you have with us. I, in your inbox, you've got my little list of I was dual tasking, listening and running through the bill. And so I get a little minor hit list. Perfect. I always uh, appreciate your attention to the details. Um, Eitan, any other thoughts as you have um, gone through the, the first sections of the bill with us? No, not at the moment, thank you. Everything that I thought I had questions about, everybody brought up. So it's great. Great. Um, so Betsy Ann, um, I was hoping that you might be able to take a look at the commissioner's reform plan, um, the commissioner's 10 point plan, not to be confused with the ACLU 10 point plan that we heard mentioned frequently um, in our public hearing. Um, we have, or, or at least I have had the, an opportunity to take a peek at Ann Donahue's comparison of the ACLU's 10 point plan and what we have before us in these bills. Um, 
And, uh, and so what I'd like to do is have an opportunity to take a look at the DPS um, modernization plan, which is DPS's 10 point plan and understand what parts of it are, uh, are captured here or at least touched on here and what parts of it might be um, things that, uh, that DPS and the legislature will come back to. Uh, Jim, your hand is up. Did you want to jump in again? Okay, and Donahue. Uh, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, you may have already uh, mentioned this at some point to your committee, but um, it's probably helpful background in terms of cross collaboration among, among committees to know that um, the House Healthcare Committee currently is looking at language. Uh, budget language because the Department of Public Safety has actually made a proposal for an initiative to uh, have uh, expand embedded uh, mental health workers in the barracks. And uh, we're looking at, you know, the, the model and uh, any recommendations we have. So that's a kind of quickly moving piece in this year's budget. Thank you. And I would love to hear um, sort of a report back after you feel like you've got a conclusion on that um, and help us understand the healthcare committee's perspective on, on what I think we have assumed would be a valuable collaboration between people who are professionally trained um, mental health responders and people who are law enforcement officers. Yes, I think that there's probably very broad consensus that that kind of collaboration has um, strong value. Um, but when you get into the details, um, you know, what, what the model should be like is what well, we're, we're taking testimony to hear. But the other heads up is there is placeholder language um, in the budget because the budget has to move before we can finish with testimony. So don't assume when you see it, folks, that that placeholder language means that's what our recommendation is going to be. Great. Thanks, Anne. Um, all right. So Betsy Ann, when, um, when would you comfortably uh, feel like you could help us understand um, how what we're looking at here meshes with the, the totality of the modernization plan as it stands right now? Well, due to the doctor's caution about needing a lot of coffee, I don't want to commit to Tuesday. <laughs> so, and, and it's a holiday weekend, yeah. so we'd like you to have a day off. <laughs> if maybe we could uh, go for more Wednesday or Thursday, that'd probably be more realistic with what I've got going on. Great. All right, we will um, we'll do a quick uh, huddle on next week's agenda and uh, and let you know. Super, and your hand is up. Did you wanna say something else? Okay. All right, committee, we are about at the end of what we had hoped to accomplish today. And um, please reach out to me if you have thoughts or questions. And thank you to the doctor and Rep Donahue for being with us. Thank you.